Anna, for the introduction and welcome to everyone this evening for joining from home. I'm really delighted to speak today on two topics that I'm very passionate about, golf and really longevity. And I've titled this talk, The Forever Fairway, uh, Strategies for Lifelong Golf. So I'm Ronan Kearney, I'm a consultant sports and exercise medicine physician, primarily based at the UPMC Sports Surgery Clinic in Santry. I also work across a number of other sports, predominantly at the moment, High Performance Centre in Sport Ireland, looking after athletics, preparing for Paris Olympics. I've also worked European Tour Golf and Legends Tour events. I also do a little bit of work in GA, and also I'm a senior clinical lecturer at Trinity College. Where I spend most of my time is at the sports surgery clinic. It's made up of the main hospital and then the sports medicine department pictured in the icons below. And the sports medicine department is really made up of a team of sports medicine consultants uh, alongside a full MDT of specialist physiotherapists, strength and conditioning coaches, biomechanists. And we work in tandem with our surgical rheumatology and radiology colleagues in the main hospital. Working in golf is very rewarding, and I hope that some of the things I've learned from working in elite golf, I can apply to the recreational golfer also. So really worldwide, 60 million people play golf in 206 countries, so huge, huge participation sport. And as we age, participation in previously accessible activities can be challenging. Golf, however, is a very popular sport for the older adult and it's a really important form of exercise as we age. So really golf in itself is a recipe for long life, for lifelong health. These are some nice infographics that the European Tour had published and did a lot of work. They did a lot of work in terms of public health and the benefits of golf overall. So physical inactivity causes over 3 million deaths worldwide per year. Golf is a fantastic form of physical activity in its own right. Typically, golf is a form of moderate intensity exercise for most people. By walking the course, you'll generally get 11,000 to 17,000 steps in. If you're like me and you spend a lot of time in the rough, it's probably closer to the 17,000 mark. If you're unable to, if you're unable to walk the course, uh, you can still achieve approximately 6,000 steps whilst golfing in, with a bogey. And that in itself still has some great benefits. Research has long proven that the more physically active we are, the greater we live in terms of time. More specifically, uh, the health benefits of golf reduce your risk of multiple medical issues and diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, colon cancer, breast cancer, dementia, and depression can be reduced by up to 33%. Hip fractures are reduced. There's a reduction of 65% of hip fractures in golfers as well. So huge benefits to be gained. And a Swedish study found that golfers have a 40% lower mortality rate than non-golfers. So that translates to an extra five years of golf. So golfers really do live longer. Anyone who plays golf also understands that the not only the physical benefits to your health, but also a great positive boost for our mental health. It has proven benefits in this domain with improved self-esteem, self-worth, uh, and reduction in risk of depression also. Golf is, however, associated with a slightly increased risk of skin cancer. So anyone who golfs out there, just make sure to get your skin checked on a regular basis. Uh, and definitely from our pale Irish uh, skin, we need to have our factor 50 at the ready. This is something that we share with professionals on the European tour in terms of some reminders to both them, but also applies to the recreation golfer in terms of that skin care. So don't, don't leave the factor 50 out of the bag. I suppose golfers can develop a number of musculoskeletal issues, which may or may not be related to the sport itself. And that's really where we as sports and exercise medicine physicians can help. We really strive to keep you as active as possible on the course as long as possible so that you achieve all those health and social benefits that we know golf brings. So what are these common issues that might, we might be able to help with? A recent uh, study looked at the common career injuries in both amateur and professional golfers. And as you can see from the table here, the most common injuries in amateur golfers are really elbow, lower back, hand, wrist, and shoulder. Lifelong golf can most definitely be cut short by injury. So appropriate management of such injuries is essential to getting you back on the course. So for the purposes of today's talk, we'll focus 
on the amateur golfers, two most common injuries, the lower back and elbow. So lower back pain makes up 16% of amateur golfers' injuries and about 41% of professional golfer injuries, more likely to be more common in professional golfers due to the larger forces that generate it, as well as the larger repetitive load placed on the lumbar spine, with professional golfers hitting hundreds of golf balls a week generally. There are a number of factors that are modifiable. These really mean that these are factors that can be changed to reduce your risk of lower back pain in playing golf. And these are a reduction in BMI. Uh, modifiable factor include poor strength, flexibility, and coordination. There are certain swing biomechanics that can lead to lower back pain. And then we know that actually carrying a bag on one shoulder can increase your risk of lower back playing golf. So the golf swing is considered one of the most difficult movements in sports. And to perform a golf swing, there's a powerful action required with rapid rotational forces being transferred to the golf ball with lots of compressive load placed in the lumbar spine, calculated to be about seven to eight times body weight. And recreation golfers have a higher degree of variation in, in swing, in muscle activation during the golf swing itself. We know that older golfers have age-related uh, muscle changes that influence their swing performance as well. And there's three typical swings that have been associated with lower, ba lower back pain golf in golfers. So the top early extension where our hips come forward into the hand space during the swing. On the left hand side, we see that early extension. On the right hand side, we don't see that early extension. In the middle, we see a reverse C finish on the left hand side which puts greater load on the lower back structures. And on the bottom, we see the reverse spine angle on the left-hand side, where we have an overextension of the lower lumbar spine during the backswing. So some of these are suspected to be associated with some lower back pain symptoms. Not to get too technical here, but there are certain swing mechanics that are more common in those with back pain. So it's really important for such mechanics to be identified and really to work closely with your golf professional to address these issues in your swing as part of the management of your injury. Some other potential modifiable factors include flexibility of hip, shoulder, thoracic spine and lumbar spine as well. So important not to neglect these in terms of your management. It's obvious that strength plays a large part both in prevention and management of golfing injuries. The professional, professional game itself has been transformed over the past decade with most top golfers now putting a large emphasis on strength and conditioning and understanding that having such preventions in place reduces the risk of injury and also improves their performance. The same principle can also be applied to the recreation golfer. So there's a number of, a number of different potential causes of lower back pain in golfers. Now we're not going to get into these in detail today, but really any, any of these can be a potential cause. To really get to the root of the problem, the lower back pain, you need to have a full assessment, both in terms of a clinical assessment, strength assessment, flexibility assessment, oftentimes biomechanics assessment, and at times imaging is necessary. To manage lower back pain in golf, really, if we take a general approach here, education will form a huge part of that. So in terms of making sure that you're aware of what you need to do to improve your symptoms. Weight loss can perform part of the management. And as we spoke about, muscle strengthening and control exercises, as well as flexibility exercises, can also be helpful. Looking at your swing biomechanics can be important as well to work alongside your golf professional, assessing that as well. But really, early golf-specific rehabilitation is is would be the most important aspect here. We're lucky enough at the sports surgery clinic to have broad access to secondary management options as well. Not always needed, but, but helpful at times to create a window of opportunity where pain doesn't prevent progress through exercise rehabilitation. The second most common injury in golfers being elbow, and it's often an overuse injury, more common in females. And unfortunately, the term tennis elbow, um, synonymous with, with playing tennis, but actually more common in golfers um, in 85% of cases. Risk factors for developing elbow pain in golfers, there's multiple different types of reasons. So that can be due to hitting too many balls in too short a time in terms of an overload. Maybe the grip is too tight or maybe it's too slippy. You may be hitting the ground before the ball. 
Uh, or if you try to change your swing very quickly without gradually trying to uh, increase the load. Can also be referred from your cervical spine. So important to keep that in the back of your mind. Oftentimes we'll see uh, wrist flexion changes at impact of the golf ball that can lead to different loads placed on the elbow. The wrist flexor burst at impact is considered to try and increase club head speed, but can lead to some uh, additional forces placed on both the outside, the lateral and the inside medial part of the lead and trail elbows. So important with golfers at wrist pain, that wrist um, position at impact is assessed. There can be a number of different causes for elbow pain in golfers. Again, that would need to be assessed as we said, inside of golfer's elbow is that medial epicondylopathy and outside of golf, outside of elbow pain generally is that lateral epicondylopathy. But really to, to truly find out exactly what the issue is, you'll need a, a full assessment, both the clinical assessment, at times a strength and flexibility assessment, and as we mentioned before, biomechanics assessment, and at times then investigations such as imaging can be necessary. Management for elbow pain in golfers depends on the diagnosis itself, but generally will consist of education of your problem, um, strength-based rehabilitation, looking at the biomechanics again, and again, coming back to that golf-specific rehabilitation. Some helping aids can be a supportive brace or, or maybe even changing your grip size, but again, will all depend on the injury itself. Management options um, that can be helpful uh, for elbow-related pain in golfers may include ultrasound guided injection options such as platelet rich plasma, potentially corticosteroid, or at times extracorporeal shockwave therapy may be helpful. So what is extracorporeal shockwave therapy? Really it's shockwave. It works by emission of acoustic waves with their shockwaves, which carry energy to the injured tissues. These shockwaves can generate tissue responses that can produce many beneficial effects such as pain relief, increased blood flow, cell growth, and where needed can disrupt calcium deposited in injured tissues. The combination of these effects can lead to improvement in injury recovery at times. And what is PRP or platelet-rich plasma? Really, it's a form of regenerative medicine that harnesses the body's ability to try and increase natural growth and healing factors to try and improve injury recovery. The blood is taken as it would be during a simple blood test, spun in a centrifuge, and then the PRP portion, which contains concentrated healing cells and factors, is injected accurately under ultrasound guidance to the target tissue. PRP is less side effect profile than traditional corticosteroid injections, and in many cases has been shown to outperform steroids in the longer term for many musculoskeletal conditions. So you manage your golfer's elbow, but settle down, and now you're trying to ensure you have lifelong golf, as we initially spoke of. So performing a warm-up means that you're less likely to get injured playing golf. Injury is three times more likely in recreational golfers without a warm-up. Here are some of the sports surgery clinic suggested warm-up routines pre-round uh, that you'll also find on the clinic website. I'd recommend that you save a copy, copy of this and bring it to your, into your pre-round pre routine. You'll often see professionals preparing for rounds hours in advance, and most of the time the rest of us are rushing out of the car to get to the first tee. How many times has it taken you two or three holes before you feel your body is ready to swing a golf club? So try and arrive early to the golf club, spend 10 or 15 minutes carrying out a free uh, golf warm up and hit a few balls in the practice round. Uh, that should help. There have been a few questions ahead of today's talk on osteoporosis in golf, so I better speak on a little on it here. I suppose, firstly, osteoporosis is a condition that means your bones have low bone mineral density and are at increased risk of fracture. It's a medical diagnosis made with the help of DEXA scanning. There can be a number of potential causes, but it's very common in about 20% of females and 6% of males over 50 years of age in Ireland have osteoporosis. It's vital that those with osteoporosis are managed appropriately, medically, often with the help of your doctor and rheumatologist. Resistant exercise plays a huge role in the treatment of osteoporosis and really should be guided by your healthcare professionals. And while golf is considered low impact, individuals with osteoporotic lower back or lumbar compression fractures should really discuss with their doctor before participating. It's crucial to assess 
the person's overall health status, bone density, pain levels, and functional strength abilities before having that decision. I look after a number of golfers with osteoporosis, and there's a number of different tips in terms of the golf swing that can reduce their chance of, of further injury. Firstly, working closely with their golf professional to ensure that their golf swing is, is a good technique. At times, rotating your lead uh, foot to externally can improve some movement through the hip joints and reduce that stress in the lower back. Shortening the back swing can decrease that rotational side bending stress in the lower back. Even something as simple as standing a little bit closer to the golf ball can reduce that forward bending and rotation of the lower back. So there's a number of different mechanical tips and tricks that can actually reduce your lower back stress, especially if you have osteoporosis, these can may well help from, from, to allow you to continue to go up into the future. So in summary, um, strategies to support injury-free golfing among recreation golfers include really a holistic approach that includes appropriate management of medical issues and injuries, exercises to improve strength, flexibility that act as both health and performance boosters, as well as injury prevention, working alongside a knowledgeable golf professional on your technique in tandem with your sports medicine physician to help identify any potential swing biomechanics that can may lead to future injury. Prepare to fail, fail to prepare. So ensure an appropriate warm up prior to playing. And most importantly, have fun golfing. Any exercise that you enjoy means you're most, most likely to do it into the years ahead. And this, as we spoke of, is going to get great health benefits for many years into the future. We're very lucky in Ireland to have such incredible golf courses. And I was lucky enough to grow up not too far from here, County Loud Golf Club. With some of the strategies we've discussed this evening, hopefully you'll be able to continue to spend years ahead in incredible places like this. As we spoke of, golf is a fantastic form of exercise for all. Not only does it add years to your life, but it also adds life to your years. And I look forward to helping keep golfers of all levels, abilities and ages on the golf course and enjoying themselves for many years to come. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time to listen today. Hope you found the talk helpful. If you did have any questions or queries, please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, I look forward to meeting some of you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan, for that talk. And Ronan will join us for our live Q&A after uh, Tommy Mooney's talk. So Tommy's our lead strength and conditioning coach here at UPMC SSC. He's going to talk fit for life and how to maintain fitness and healthy lifestyle as we age. Uh, just to let you know as well, there are other talks on our website if you're interested um, for the public on hip and knee replacement for runners, hikers, uh, if you play rugby. For most sports, you'll find something there and relating to um, shoulders, knees, button and ankle as well. So please go on there if you want to have a look. We will be sending a survey out. We please fill in the survey. It does help us to know what you want to hear about um, and if there's anything that you didn't find useful either. So I'm now going to present uh, Tommy and we will talk to Tommy and Roland afterwards for a live Q&A. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Um, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to tune in. This evening, I will be talking about uh, Fit for Life, how to maintain strength, fitness, and a healthy lifestyle as we age. I will plan to summarize some of the evidence base regarding healthy aging, particularly as it pertains to golf performance, and offer some practical examples of what you can do to help improve your own fitness and golf performance. But just don't blame me if your handicap doesn't come down this summer. I think it's well understood the importance of being fit for a myriad of lifestyle factors such as benefits, uh, such as general health, longevity, mental well-being, weight management, etc. But what do we mean by being fit? Fit means many things to many people, whether it's uh, group or individual activities, indoors or outdoors, casual or competitive, cardiovascular based or strength or flexibility based. Tonight, we're more interested in fitness as it pertains to golf. We can likely all agree that Rory is a fitter golfer than John Daly. But that being said, not many of us would fancy going toe to toe with John Daly on the golf course or in the clubhouse bar. It's outside the scope of this talk to talk about the technical factors that contribute to golf. For that, you've got to go to your golf course or your golf pro. But instead, we'll talk about some of the physical factors 
and what we can do to change them to help improve our golf performance. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the importance of muscular strength. So why is strength important? Well, I'm sure anyone who has watched the next Netflix full swing documentary has seen this uh, custom built state of the art gym that the PGA Tour bring with them uh, around the country to all of the major events to allow all the elite golfers maintain their strength and conditioning work uh, whilst on tour. But strength is also important for the aging golfer. Aging is commonly associated with a loss of muscle mass and strength, which can often result in uh, falls, uh, functional decline, feelings of subjective weakness, um, or on the golf course that might look like a loss of distance or, or fatigue. Again, like as I mentioned, typically as we age, we see a loss of muscle mass. This is shown here in this study um, with these two MRI images, one of a 60-year-old woman versus an 80-year-old woman. And basically what we're looking at here is the, the muscle mass, so the darker material versus the white uh, material being more fatty infiltration. Okay, as you can see, as we age, typically we see the number and size of that muscle mass. In this instant, this is your quadricep muscle, and um, we see that decrease, whilst we see the fatty infiltration and collagen uh, increase. However, this does not have to be the case. This particular study looked at 40 masters athletes aged between 40 to 81 years old who trained four to five times a week. During this study, they underwent tests of uh, body composition, quadriceps strength, and bilateral MRIs shown here. And what we can see here is that uh, a 40 year old master's uh, triathlete relative to sedentary versus an, an active population. And basically, what we see here is that the muscle mass, size, uh, and number of uh, muscle fibers maintains really well in that active population. Versus in our sedentary population, what we see is that increase in adipose or, or fatty infiltration into the, into the muscle. So ultimately, this study contradicts the common belief that as we age, we lose muscle mass and strength and perhaps suggests that um, that loss of muscle mass and strength that we often see is, is maybe a factor or a product of disuse rather than aging alone. This obviously has an uh, important uh, benefits then for um, our ability on the golf course and or off the golf course and will help us to maintain that muscle mass and strength and eliminate some of those risks we mentioned earlier around functional decline, a loss of independence and falls. Okay. Another, uh, another thing that can often hamper our golf performance is, is injury. Time away from the golf course due to injury is obviously going to have a knock-on effect, not only on our general health, strength and fitness, but also on our handicap. So uh, injury can often be the start of that disuse that we mentioned, okay? Uh, Post-injury, resistance training is really important. Um, it's been shown here in a number of studies, um, and we see it daily here in the clinic, that it improves function, reduces pain scores, uh, helps improve strength and gait. So strength plays a fairly key role in keeping us on the course, as well as benefiting performance, as we've mentioned. If all of that doesn't sway your opinion on, on the necessity of strength as a part of our, our as a part of our exercise routine, um, this particular meta-analysis looked at over or nearly two million participants over thirty eight studies, um, and basically what they found with this was adults with higher levels of strength had a lower risk of death when compared to those with lower levels of muscular strength. Okay. So as a general guideline, um, in 2015, the WHO changed their guidance to include strength training uh, twice per week. And basically those guidelines look like this, okay? So uh, trying to incentivize uh, 150 minutes of light activity a week. Again, if we're playing golf, we're probably ticking this box uh, quite easily. 75 minutes of vigorous activity. So that's, you know, increasing our heart rate, getting out of breath a little bit more. Strength training, as we men mentioned, um, and ultimately trying to include some form of balance, balance training and or minimizing sedentary time. Again, if we're on the golf course a couple of times a week, we probably tick a couple of these boxes anyway, but strength training is maybe one that we're not going to tick whilst on the golf course. 
Again, it's important to note that these are generalized guide guidelines and do need to be adapted to the individual, but they do go to show the importance of strength. So by now you're probably wondering how does Rory lifting weights in the gym contribute to him hitting drives or performing well on the golf course? This review, uh, this review article examined the existing scientific literature regarding strength training in healthy, uh, non-injured golfers. The study analyzed the relationship between muscle strength, swing performance, such as club head speed, driving distance, ball speed, and skill. A skill being handicap or, or, or score on the round. The results seem to indicate that one, there's a positive relationship between handicap and swing performance, although relatively few studies have been investigated in this area. Two, there is a positive correlation between handicap and muscle strength. And three, that there is a distinct uh, relationship between driving distance, swing speed, ball speed, and muscle strength. The results go on to show then and demonstrate that uh, training of the lower leg, hip extensors, trunk power and strength, as well as grip strength are relevant for improved golf performance. This slide shows a, a sample training program uh, or strength plan for, uh, for a golfer. Obviously, it's important that these programs are individualized, so it is, it is best to consult a professional when, when looking to begin any, any new strength plan. Um, ideally, we want to try and meet the individual where they're at. For example, someone who has a history of training regularly versus someone who's coming from a more sedentary base. Um, this particular example is a six-week program aimed at a relatively well-trained individual with a good experience of strength training. To show you some of these exercises, again, these are some advanced exercises for, for someone maybe who hasn't exercised or, or done some strength training before to talk through some of these. So in the top left here, we have a, a rack deadlift exercise uh, looking to build up posterior chain strength. Here we have a hip thrust exercise, again, looking to develop gluteal and hip extensor strength. Again, these are going to be important exercises when we think of our follow through in the drive and developing that hip musculature. We have some upper body exercises here in our push up, our single arm pull down and our single arm press. We have some uh, lower limb also working on balance here with our split squat, a single leg squat working on our uh, single leg strength, as well as our T-spine rotation here working on rotational uh, mobility and flexibility. So here are some general guidelines for, for strength training. As we start uh, uh, as a beginner, we want to focus more on low, lighter resistance or utilizing bodyweight exercises. We might start with slightly higher repetitions and lower, lower sets, and that can progress into heavier, rep heavier weights um, with lower volume. Again, the session per week might be reduced or less to start, one to two, and that could gradually progress as we become more advanced. In terms of exercises, again, some some example exercises here. And um, these are obviously not all of the all of the exercises that might be used, but just giving you an example of of some that might be used uh, across a couple of different type of uh, movements. Okay, and um, it's not necessarily the case that we might move linearly from one, whereas we might be a little bit more advanced in one area, but struggle with upper body strength and be a little bit uh, down the, the pecking order in 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 upper body strength. And um, just to worth noting, again, I won't talk you through all of these. Some of these have already popped up in the video earlier, but more just to give an example of, of some exercises that can be, can be utilized in a, in a strength training plan. Next, then, it would be remiss not to mention uh, the importance of cardiovascular exercise, although I think everyone understands the benefits of cardiovascular exercise in terms of weight gain, uh, reducing inflammation, and reducing the risk of chronic disease. So just to quickly talk through it, uh, this particular meta-analysis looked at 33 studies uh, with over 100,000 participants. Um, and basically what they found here was that those people with better cardiovascular fitness uh, had a lower uh, all-cause mortality or incidence of coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. And essentially recommends that uh, working on our fitness 
whatever form of fitness that might 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 take uh, is beneficial towards all cause of mortality. So some guidelines around cardiovascular fitness. And again, this is probably something we're, we're mostly familiar with is that we want to try and get out of breath. Again, if we're playing golf, we probably get that lower um, intensity exercise ticked off, as we mentioned earlier from the WHO recommendations. But maybe we could challenge ourselves a little bit more with some slightly more intensive activities throughout the week. Again, that starting point is going to be dependent on your, your current level of fitness. Examples might include some fast or fast walking, walking and running, running, cycling, swimming can all be effective methods. And um, naturally with golf, we, we often enjoyed the social aspect. That should be no different for whether it's strength training or cardiovascular training, having a training partner um, and someone to keep you uh, adherent and honest is often beneficial. And then trying to make uh, uh, measures of progress. We track our handicaps. We track our, our scores on the golf course. It should be no different then in terms of our training uh, off the golf course as well. And lastly, again, as I mentioned, getting advice. If you're unsure where to start, that's where getting advice from a professional is key. Um, general guidelines here, again, not targeted at anyone particularly and will naturally depend, uh, change dependent on your, on your own current levels of fitness. But aiming for three days a week, some of that might be made up from, from our golf. Uh, but outside of the golf, then what, what are we doing or is there other activities we could include there? Um, again, we mentioned about... Uh, perhaps looking to utilize some higher intensity exercises we're going to where we're going to push that heart rate into the higher higher ranges or higher levels again our steady state stuff is going to be largely ticked off from our golf course especially if we're playing a couple of rounds a week but then the interval training op, uh, option might offer a, a good uh, a good alternative to uh, challenge those more intensive uh, cardiovascular sessions and see those benefits as we mentioned here then at UPMC SSC, we offer some uh, bespoke fitness testing. It is covered by a, a series of different uh, health insurers, VHI in particular offer uh, to fully cover the cost of, of our fitness testing here. Um, the fitness testing uh, covers a very a variety of different uh, elements. So we'll look at body composition, upper body strength, lower body strength, as well as power. We can also include swing speed assessment, um, as well as a cardiovascular fitness test uh, or VO2 max, which can be performed on a treadmill as shown or on an exercise bike. Testing is obviously one part of the equation, but then it's implementing those testing results into a bespoke, uh, into a bespoke program for the individual, depending on what their goals are. Um, and again, off the back of all this testing, then we can offer a bespoke training plan as well. Again, that's all included as part of the, the VHI package, as I mentioned earlier. So if you if you would like more information around that, you can email the email below, or if you do have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them now as well. Tommy, uh, Tommy and Ronan are here now. Thank you, Tommy, for that presentation. So they're both here now, and we're going to go through. There's a lot of questions coming in. So the first question is from Fiona about: Do you see a different distribution of golf injuries between male and female? Firstly. And then at different ages. Now, there are two more questions about teenagers in there. So I'm going to combine them with that as well. But if we just start with the male and female. Yeah, no, great question. I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so definitely in female golfers, we definitely would see quite a lot of hip related symptoms generally around the, the outside of the hip or the lateral hip, I suppose. Traditionally might have been known as trochanteric bursitis. But generally, we find that it seems to be a lot related with the gluteal tendons. And, um, and 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 generally weakness around this area. So strength and 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 conditioning forms a huge part of treatment of that. Um, from that side of things, I suppose in terms of um, the the older male golfer, as we discussed in the talk, lower back pain and elbow issues seem to be very common uh, in the recreational older golfer. Um, and osteoarthritis obviously plays a big part in terms of knee and hip as well. So I suppose. From from that male versus female, definitely there's a there, there would be some more common in females than not, and, and likewise in males as well. Um, in terms of the the teenage golfer and the younger golfer, you know, tend to see more bone stress injuries in in lower back, uh, as as probably one of the more common injuries that we would see in in the sports surgery clinic with golfers of that age group, and generally they'll 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 have come in, they've played quite a lot of golf. They might be on a number of different sports teams outside of the golf course itself. Um, they may be deficient in a number of different strength me metrics um, and oftentimes their pain will be there for quite some time. And 
And that's where I suppose we work really closely with the strength and conditioning coaches as well in terms of seeing to identify where exactly their deficits are and to try and build the structures around the, the joints and bones back up again. And and I know Tommy has, has great expertise in that area as well. Yeah, Tommy, the, that part of that was people were asking, what would you recommend for teenage golfers? One, to be mindful of. And secondly, what age should they start strength training? Yeah, another another great question. So in, in terms of what to be mindful of, it's going to be around exercise technique and guidance and um, ensuring that they're performing, I suppose, the right exercises, the right way at the right intensities and have someone to give them feedback uh, rather than maybe just picking random exercises off the Internet or trying to copy maybe what the elite pros are doing who have 10 to 15 years of training behind them. And um, in terms of age, um, there's never really too young. You know, it's finding the right exercise for the right age. Obviously, a, a, a young person or a 15 year old with no experience of lifting weights isn't going into the gym and lifting maximally in the gym. Um, but they could start, start on softer resistances or body weight exercises. So they're still going to develop strength and, and motor control and capacity. Um, but not using the heavier kind of loads that you might have seen in some of the exercises or videos there. Um, and then over time, as they develop uh, competency and get better at, at the lifting and techniques, then they can look to progress onto more challenging, uh, more difficult or more intensive or heavier exercises as, as they get older and or more competent. So I wouldn't necessarily put an age on it um, and more about a competency led approach. So as they get better at it, they then are able to progress to harder or heavier exercises. Okay, thanks, Tommy. Um, his question here, I've been diagnosed, this one for you, Ronan, I think, with golfer's elbow, having played for over 35 years. I've tried microneedling, a wear and tear fabric elbow support, neither help, helped. But recently I've been in much less discomfort. Is it likely that pain will return? And what would my options be? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, I think we, co we covered quite some of that in the talk as well, but I suppose just to harbour on some of the points on that. So golfer's elbow is generally pain on the inside of the elbow or the medial epicondyl of the elbow. Um, oftentimes it is an overuse injury, but can be often often be related to technique, um, to the surface that you might be, be hitting golf balls on. Oftentimes we will find that, that people that hit balls from a hard driving range mat actually tend to start to irritate the medial elbow as well. So the commute, I suppose, first things first, identify the triggers. Um, is there differences in their in their grip strength that's changed their their trigger to the, the elbow pain itself? I suppose, will, thankfully, it's gone away in, in your case. And will it come back? Hopefully not. Um, you know, if it does, and if you've had it for 30 years, um, I suppose one question I'd ask, is it is it truly golfer's elbow or is there something else going on? So I suppose having it fully fully assessed, on that front, you know, we, we see quite a lot of uh, golfer's elbow in the clinic. And as I mentioned in the talk, we, we have a number of different modalities available to use, I suppose, if the traditional approach isn't helping. Um, but oftentimes getting the exercises right are, are the most important part and, and to try and uh, add some recovery within to the week. Um, but we do have the options of extracorporeal shockwave therapy and injection options like platelet-rich plasma and or corticosteroid as well that can be helpful in certain cases as well. So I'd, I'd get it assessed if it does flare up. Um, if it's gone away, hopefully it'll stay away. Okay, thanks, Ronan. Uh, question here from Nicky McGrath. Is yoga stretching good for your golf game or is there other stretch routines that you would recommend to prevent injury occurring as would only play at the weekend and walk straight to the first tee without any warm up or stretching? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, a couple of bits in that, I suppose. So um, in terms of yoga developing strength, it's going to depend. Um, depends what your, your training background and history is there. If you're new to it, certain poses might have a, a beneficial and strengthening effect. Um, in terms of if you do have a, a large experience with yoga, it's about making them poses more challenging or more difficult or perhaps introducing a new form of exercises to continue developing strength. Um, from a flexibility perspective, it depends. If we're limited in range, then of course, yes, flexibility, stretching and certain yoga poses are going to help with that, of course. Uh, so it can be beneficial. But if we already have full range of motion and can complete you know, our full backswing and are happy with that, um, we're probably not going to get a huge amount more benefit out of that. 
and potentially could be better served uh, going after different types of exercises. Um, from a warm-up perspective, yeah, it's going to be pretty crucial. Um, golf is obviously a game of, of skill. So I would suggest for your warm-up, you want to try and make it as golf-specific as possible, which is probably going to mean getting onto the putting green or chipping or into the nets. Um, I suppose the counter-argument there is that a game of golf might last four or five hours. So you want to be careful that you're not uh, fatiguing yourself before you go out and then you know you, you blow up over the last six holes so it's about trying to find the sweet balance there between uh, enough to physically warm up mentally warm up but not fatigue yourself so that you're going on to the first tee tired or, 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 or paying for it later so that you can i suppose optimize your performance on the first tee but also still maintain that then onto the onto the 18 tee box as well um but i would be inclined to suggest keeping that as golf specific as possible rather than doing a host of different exercises that aren't necessarily specific to golf tying yourself out and then you know have a negative result on your golf game but maybe you feel better for it um so so it does depend there a little bit yeah Thanks, Tommy. Uh, now, any cure for uh, the pain of missing short parts from Niall? Can <laughs> anyone help him with that one? I have, I have a little bit of experience with that myself <laughs> as well. So um, a little bit of trial and error with treatments and whatnot. But I, what I found helpful is that Bob Rotella, uh, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect, uh, as a golf psychology book to be helpful on that front. <laughs> um, the, the dreaded gyps that we all fear, um, I unfortunately I don't have the solution to that if I did I don't think I'd be on this webinar but uh I think I think I think in terms of I suppose the psychology of golf I suppose that we all we all know how important that is so so that doesn't just come back to missing short putts but I suppose on the first tee and and all that comes with it it's not just your physical health but obviously um your 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 mental health not only the boost it does give for your mental health but actually um focusing on your on your performance psychology I think can be helpful with your game and then obviously with your health as well in the future. So that's just Bob Rotella is a plug there. Thanks, Ronan. Um, uh, someone said, Kieran, I see a lot of influencers take, talking like doctors on Instagram in relation to mobility after one TP1 course. Have you seen many injuries from likes of this? Yeah, I might take that question as well. Uh, yeah. Look, I, there's a number of different courses out there. I know that course, familiar with it as well. It's it's quite helpful from a functional patterns and a, and a functional movement of the golf swing. It's interesting. Um, I suppose the challenge is that I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't um, brand all golfers under the one brush. I think taking an individual approach, we, we know that everyone runs differently. Everyone moves differently. Everyone swings the golf differently. Um, so I think by, by giving everyone with the, the copy and paste approach to, to management of their injuries, I suppose it just doesn't really work for the most part. So, taking an individual approach on both their their movement of their golf swing their movement in general their strength and and their injury i suppose is the most important important aspect there so yeah there is there is benefit of of, of some of those courses but um i think treating everyone as an individual rather than as a group is the most important uh, takeaway from that question really for me okay now so on your here's asking about returning to golf anything to be mindful of return to golf after a hip replacement now I know we're always going to say anyone that's asking about after certain surgeries, they should always check in with their surgeon first on their six week review or their three month review, whether it's time to go back. So I suppose once they've been given the OK by their surgeon, then what should they be mindful of once they return out there? Yeah. Yeah. So like you said, it, it depends on what stage of the, the rehab journey yeah. they're at there. Um, the key thing is that it's progressive Um, you know we're starting light and gradually building up so you know very early doors obviously it's going to be a sore and stiff hip so we want to try and gradually progress the range of motion there we want to get back into building up the strength in those muscles that are going to be sore and deconditioned after the surgery it's about getting back walking with a normal gait pattern and then gradually increasing that walking volume from there, once we've been given the all clear and we've kind of ticked those boxes, then maybe introducing some rotational type exercises. So kind of practicing the golf swing again. Um, and then it's a gradual progression from there. So, you know, initially it's probably getting down to the range and practicing at the range under, like, I suppose, your own kind of time remit um, and then gradually building up your 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 golf volume so starting at nine holes or even six holes and just gradually progressing that the the really important thing is that we're back very comfortable walking with our normal gait pattern before we're looking to to take on 18 holes because obviously there's going to be a lot of steps over the course of a, of a round so we want to have built up that bit of conditioning off the golf course so that we can take it onto the golf course thanks tommy
Okay, thank you. Um, what is the best recovery for Achilles tendonitis after numerous physio appointments? It's still not clear after nine months. Is further investigation a better option? Example, MRI, X-ray, and a consultant appointment. Yeah, look, I suppose tendinopathy in general, we would see quite a bit of that at the uh, in the sports medicine department, and Achilles tendinopathy would be really one of the most common things we would see on that front. Um, it's a common issue. There's multiple different causes to it. Um, I suppose treating it uh, on a case by case basis is the most important. We could get into the the detail of it in terms of different types of Achilles tendinopathy, those that occur at the insertion point to the heel versus those that occur at the mid portion or the middle point of the Achilles tendon itself are treated very differently. There can be associated conditions, inflammatory type conditions with the insertional type Achilles tendon problems. So oftentimes that oftentimes that involves some investigations, including blood work. Um, but for the mainstay, load management and, and treating tendons, especially Achilles tendons with appropriate exercise and appropriate loading exercises is the mainstay of management. There are additional adjuncts of treatments that can be helpful from symptoms and and if there's more um significant injury like extracorporeal shockwave therapy as we said uh, and obviously injection therapies can be at times helpful um but again would depend on the the detail of the injury itself so if somebody is struggling somebody is struggling for nine months with an achilles tendinopathy um you know there, there are there are there is help out there and don't be afraid to reach out okay thanks Ronan. uh uh, Tommy, one for you. Is swimming considered a weekly strength session? So swimming would probably fall more on the, the cardiovascular side of that equation. Um, obviously, there is some resistance involved in it, but but typically, no, it's going to be more of a, a cardiovascular type session. So still a lot of health benefits going to be associated that, with that. But if we are sp specifically trying to train and develop strength adaptations, there's probably more um, or better options out there, like some of the ones we mentioned in the talk earlier. Okay, Ronan, uh, Ben, is it dangerous to play golf with a TFCC tear that was non-surgically treated five years ago and can such injury heal? Can you give more information on the ultrasonic treatment mentioned by the doctor for the treatment or can you recommend a treatment for thinning cartilage in TFCC tears? Yeah, so TFCC, TFCC tears are, they're basically tears of the, in the little piece of cartilage at the, the, the end of your ulna or end of your 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 forearm bone basically and your wrist joint itself i suppose firstly if you were to get an mri of your wrist and we mri every golfer in the country's wrist we'd see a lot of tfcc tears that mightn't actually be causing the problem so it's really important to to correlate or to basically correlate your your mri findings with your clinical exam to make sure that that's exactly the structure that's causing the problems yeah and if if it's a symptomatic or if it's a tfcc tear that's causing you problems and causing you symptoms Generally, the first line treatment for that will will be injection therapy. Will will be considered to be injection therapy. Um, we generally do those injections under ultrasound guidance. Um, generally, it will involve a corticosteroid type injection. If it becomes very problematic and it starts to 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 irritate the joint significantly, and, and injection therapies aren't settling it, sometimes um, people go on to have uh, keyhole surgery for their TFCC tears, but. Again, a little bit like the Achilles tendon problem is somebody is struggling with wrist pain for five years. Um, you know, you know, we're here to help if needs be. You know, so there's lots of there's lots of options out there with with regards to managing options. Thankfully, now. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Someone's asked here. Hold, let me just get that question. Tommy, do you think the Pilates reformer has part to play in offering a method for general injury prevention? Yeah. Again, I suppose like like the other questions there, it's it's going to be you have to take it on a case by case basis. So certainly it can be beneficial. Um, a lot of people will find it beneficial um, in terms of developing strength and conditioning throughout the core and kind of gluteal muscles. So it, absolutely, it can be beneficial. Um, and ultimately, it depends what level we're coming from. You know, if someone's been doing reformer Pilates for five years, maybe it's not as beneficial to them anymore. And there are other options. Uh, if you've never done it, then it's trying to find the appropriate level to start at that should help then develop strength. Um, so absolutely, it can be beneficial. Like I said, there's a 101 different exercise, 101 million different exercise we can do to to try and develop strength. So it's not necessarily just the couple that I showed in the in the video in the in the video earlier. Um, there are lots of different options out there, and Reformer Pilates is certainly one of them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, can strength training help tendinopathies around the hips in women in their 60s if they're playing golf? 
that for me. Yeah, or Roland. Uh, well, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, similar to kind of the the hip replacement question earlier, it's it's going to absolutely be beneficial and and certainly a part of uh, a part of what I mentioned in the talk about so maybe that disuse or that loss of muscle mass and strength that we alluded to earlier. Um, and strength can help offset that. So it's absolutely going to be beneficial. Again, the key with ten- tendinopathies is finding the right the right kind of loading you know it's almost like a, a goldilocks effect we don't want to be too hot and too hard or, or too soft and too light um so we want to try and find the right amount for the at the right person at the right time um, and then gradually increase that progressively so um it's hard to say specifically what the best exercise for that person is yeah. but certainly strength training as as a general concept is is going to be beneficial for sure yeah Vernon, uh Martin here said he's 50 year old, he's significant number of his golf friends are having difficulty with their knees, specifically getting their knees replaced. Is this common? So it's probably more about Yeah. Yeah. You but you mentioned osteoarthritis in your talk. So <laughs> Yeah, so th- thankfully, I suppose golf is not a is not a very heavy loading sport for your joints in many ways. It's a low to moderate intensity exercise. So it's unlikely the golf has caused their knee or osteoarthritis, is what I would say. Um in many ways, golf can be a form of management and treatment of knee osteoarthritis. Um, we know movement and exercise is probably one of the most important parts for pe- parts of management for people with osteoarthritis. Um, so I suspect there's probably other uh, factors at play there uh, for, for that golfer and his friends as well. Okay, thank you. Um, 68-year-old golfer, arthritis in the spine. There's a few spinal questions here. Um Will exercise help to reduce the amount of t- the chance of getting injured after if they're going to play golf? And someone else is talking after spinal surgery, say a, a microdiscectomy, would core strengthening help them before they go out to play golf? So there's two spinal questions there, I suppose, for either of you, if you both want to talk about the spine. Yeah, I might start yeah. on that one first. That's okay, Tommy. I suppose in terms of the, the spinal arthritis, I suppose. Um, so, so again, common for people to have have facet joint arthritis or a jo- joint arthritis in their in their lower back, oftentimes, um, and strength definitely plays a huge role in management of that. Um, just making sure, I suppose, in terms of other other potential um, reasons for having back pain, not to be overlooked. So, so not just to put it down to, to joint arthritis. If there is other issues, if the person is having leg pain, weakness, nerve symptoms down their legs, you know. Don't don't ignore is what I would say. Just get it checked. But um, but yeah, from, from most definitely strength training would play a huge part. And 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 again, like post your your micro disectomy again, once you've got the clearance from your surgeon that you're 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 able to return to your exercise, then working alongside um your therapist, be it your physiotherapist, strength and conditioning coach, uh, to try and help build strength and improve function and movement is going to be a huge part. And I know Tommy has has interest in that area as well. Yeah, Tommy, I think, yeah, that's, I think that is a key question there about building up that core strength for those people with spinal injuries or uh, undergoing spinal surgery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sim- similar to the previous, it's it's about trying to find the level they're at now, um, introducing the appropriate exercise and then gradually increasing that and building that up o- over time. Okay, lovely, thanks. Someone here is asking um, heel pain. Is there anything to do with heel pain that gets aggravated when they're playing golf? Heel pain, I suppose it depends on the cause of the heel pain. Most commonly, I suppose, to, to kind of take the top one, most common cause of heel pain in, in, in golfers or in people that are active would be probably plantar fascial pain or plantar fasciitis, um, which is a tricky uh, diagnosis in its own right and, and a difficult thing to manage. If anyone who's had it will know that it can last for quite some time. And the way I like to discuss management with people is really to try and push the the train so far down the track that we can kind of speed it up to to resolve it um and and with that i suppose you'll have a number of different stretchings stretching calf exercises people wear night splints at night time that can be helpful as well they'll have all tried the the cold water bottle on the on the foot um and oftentimes shockwave therapy can be quite helpful for those type patients um if that if the patient is still not responding to those type of management options then we do have Injection options, again, platelet-rich plasma and corticosteroid can be considered um, if if the first line up, if the first line management exercise uh, 
aren't aren't improving. Um, but yeah, that's probably the most common cause of heel pain in okay. in golfers and, and people that are very active. Lovely, thank you. Um, a few people here asking. I don't know whether yet. Yeah, Tommy about following rotator cuff surgery. When about going back to play golf after rotator cuff surgery? Um, yeah. So look, that's going to be very similar to um the hip question earlier. Yeah. So look, it's it's going to be about based off the guidance of your your consultant and and the physio that you're likely working with, um and working closely with them and following a gradual progression again in, in exercise intensity. So uh, regarding that, again, you're going to be pretty stiff and sore early doors. There's going to be a reduction in the range of motion. That's obviously going to limit your ability to swing. So it's about gradually um, increasing the the movement, the range, the strength in, in the shoulder and particularly the rotator cuff um, and then gradually reintroducing things like your golf swing. So probably doing it in more of a, a kind of static controlled environment first, progressing onto the range and then gradually building up your, your golfing or swing uh, swing volume. Obviously, the lower body or the walking con uh, point of golf probably isn't so much a factor there, but more just the amount of balls you're hitting. So so I'd, I'd use that as a key kind of metric. How many balls am I hitting per session and gradually increasing that over over a period of time? Okay, lovely. I don't it's some either of you can answer this question about the wrists. Someone's talking about um wrists get sore randomly, strained from golf strikes. Any ideas to strengthen the grip strength? Yeah, I suppose that grip if grip pain with golf or wrist pain with golf is, is really common, especially in, in the professional golfers, it's probably the most most common reason that they'll they'll kind of seek medical attention in many ways. And oftentimes it is an overuse type injury in professional golfers and in amateur golfers it can be more related to their to their swing to the mechanics of of the swing itself um they may well have an injury that that has just flared up and and, and occurs and it could be that tfcc it could be the the wrist joint itself um so i suppose it's hard to give specific uh, recommendations on on a general wrist pain but but I would look at your mechanics, have a chat with your golf pro in terms of your your swing to see is it a is it a, is it related to, you know, your impact or or is there another thing at play? And if if it doesn't seem to be settling with those, then then get it checked out. Um, there's another question actually there on on stress fractures. I might answer before yeah. we, we finish yeah. it out if that's yeah. okay. Are hip stress fractures common in golfers? No, thankfully they're not. Uh, do see quite a lot of hip stress fractures and 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 pelvic stress fractures in in athletic individuals so in 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 runners and and endurance runners particularly um the stress fractures that are common in golf would be in your younger golfers so your your teenage golfers that play quite a lot and they would be in your lower lumbar spine region um so 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 back pain that's sore at nighttime that wakes somebody up from from sleep at nighttime in a young teenager um, that that is worse with exercise um can be signs of a, of a lumbar par stress stress injury um and and as we spoke during the talk on the q a there will be a period of time needed for healing of that stress fracture but but then after that the key component of their management will be will be strength and will be building the strength around the lumbar spine to prevent it from happening again um but yeah thankfully not not too common in terms of um, older golfers, the 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 compression fractures in in older golfers might be related to osteoporosis, and I think we cover that in the talk as well. Um, but yeah, no hip stress fractures are not uh, not something we see too frequently in golfers, not related to the golf anyway. Yeah, uh, someone's asking, what is the best way to treat golfers' elbow? Yeah, that's I suppose we we covered some of that in the talk as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I suppose really I suppose identifying the triggers. Um, making sure that the exercises are appropriate for that person, um, making sure the diagnosis is correct, um, and if 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 all is not settling with those three approaches, then considering extra um, management options like your shockwave, like your injection therapies potentially, um, and and working alongside your golf pro in terms of your your swing mechanics uh, and to see if there is a a trigger in terms of um, your your actual swing is that why you've developed it. Um, but yeah, I suppose we covered a lot of that in the, in the presentation. So, so we probably cover that in greater detail. Okay. On that. Lovely. Thanks for both joining us tonight and everyone that's joined us tonight as well. But if you're interested in any of these talks, they will be up on the website. We do have other talks up there. Um, there are previous talks on golf, 
We have ones for hikers, runners, um, hip or knee replacement. We cover a lot of subjects. So if you want to go in, um, there are public talks available on our website. We will be sending a survey out. If you could fill that in, that's great. It's always helpful to know if there's anything that you'd like to hear about and, and to help us um, produce our programs for, for next year as well. So just want to say thank you again to Tommy and Ronan and good night to everyone. Thank you.